boa tarde. Olá, o meu nome é Liliana Coutinho, eu sou responsável do programa de debates e conferências e uma das organizadoras deste ciclo de Memórias Coloniais. Uh, como puderam ver também na divulgação deste uh, debate, não se ouve? Agora ouve-se. Ouve-se, sim. Obrigada. Uh, bom, estava me a apresentar e a dizer uh, que sou uma das responsáveis pela curadoria deste ciclo uh, e da parte da Cultura Gesto gostava de vos dar as, as boas-vindas ao público e aos convidados. Uh, como puderam ver também no anúncio deste debate, uh, a língua uh, de trabalho será o inglês, portanto eu vou agora passar para o inglês para que uh, todos, uh, há várias pessoas na, também na plateia que, que falam esta língua, portanto eu vou mudar de língua. So, um, my name is Liliana Cotin, I'm from Culture Rest team and I'm here to welcome you uh, and also to say uh, uh, thank you to Goethe Institute also to, to um, for the work that we developed together. Uh, this program that starts today with um, this round table is part of a larger uh, program. The title is Colonial Memories. Uh, you have all the information uh, in our website or our, uh, our brochure uh, in this leaflet where you can also find uh, texts about uh, this program and it's posed by different perspective on this um, on the colonial memories i also invite you to visit uh, an installation uh, that it's part of a theater piece that will um, be premiered in the um, 26th so in two days in our uh, auditorium uh, and this theater piece that was uh, uh, it's uh, um, the, the by the Hotel Europa company, uh, it was somehow the, uh, the piece that triggered the construction of all those cycle of debates. So I will uh, uh, give you the word, Susan. Uh, Susan will do a brief uh, introduction, introduction to the program that, the program that we organize with Goat Institute. So thank you also again. Yeah, yeah. boa tarde. O meu nome é Susana Spora, eu sou a diretora do Goethe-Instituto, também eu vou falar em inglês, peço desculpa, mas temos muitas pessoas aqui que não percebem em português, então, um, I'm very pleased uh, to announce tonight together with Liliana Coutinho, thank you so much for it, the opening of Everything Passes Except the Past, a program series the Goethe-Institute has organized in several European countries, together always with local partners as here with Kultur Jest and the Cinemateca. And the Lisbon chapter of this regional program is starting today in this framework of this uh, of the Ciclo Memori Memorias Coloniais and, and we are really happy to have been able, able to work with this amazing partner here in Lisbon. I, I'm, it's really important for me to say that. And we are thankful to know uh, the Cinemateca Portuguesa as well on our side. And the Goethe Institute um, has placed this issue, this question about uh, post-colonialism on, uh, as one of, this, of uh, the central international topics on its agenda and organizes worldwide a lot of conferences and, and debates. And many of uh, these take place in uh, Germany and in Afri African countries. And um, now we are happy to, to bring this a discussion which is really worth to discuss in, in Europe uh, to, 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 to Portugal in this framework. Everything Passes Except the Past is a research and an event project. The Goethe Institute in Southwest Europe has began already in April this year and under the guidance of uh, the Goethe Institute in Brussels, a total of four workshops are organized as well as public debates, lectures, performances and a film series which pretend to trigger an artistic and discursive confrontation with the past that remains present. Uh, after the opening event in Brussels in, in April, the second part of this project is now taking place here in Lisbon and it will be continued in Bordeaux and at the end in, of the year in Barcelona. And the panel discussion, the colonial film archives, to which I would like to warmly welcome today, opens the public part of our program here in Culture Gest. 
The second part consists of a three-day film series taking place from tomorrow on till the 27th of September in the small audience, in this auditorium here. And um, the series includes restored uh, archive material as well as current films that deal with archive images of colonial or militant origin. Among them are films that have already been shown in Portugal, but also those that have never been shown here before. Um, the history of the origin of these archive materials, their impact up to the present day, and the ethical questions regarding their use will be discussed with experts and filmmakers, and the series was created by Maria Ducan Pizarra. But now back to the today's panel discussion, the colonial film archives, a conversation with Philippa Cesar, Fradike, Didi Cheka, and Tama El Said, and it will be shared by Stephanie Schulte Strathaus, um, and was also designed by her. Stephanie Schulte Strathaus is co-director of the Arsenal Institute for Film and Video Art Berlin, and the founding director of Forum Expanded section of the Berlinale. Since 2010, her focus has been on the Arsenal's film archive and the development of new concepts for the creation of film archives in general. The two, days, the two days panel discussion picks up central topics of our internal workshop, which runs parallel to the series of public events, the relationship between archive and power, the strategies of film archives in dealing with its material and the challenges of digitalization. And last but not least, it will focus on artistic approaches working with colonial archive material and material from colonial liberation struggle. I very much hope that we will be able to welcome you to this film sessions next few days. And now I'd like to give the stage to Stephanie Schulte Strathaus, who will present the, participant, the participants of the debate. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Susanne Sparra. I'm very happy and honored to moderate the opening panel of the Lisbon edition of Goethe Institute's large-scale project, Everything Passes, Everything Except the Past, which is also part of the colonial memory cycle here at Kulturgesch. And I would like to thank Susanne Sporra and Teresa Eiten and Corinna Lawrence and everyone who was involved at the Goethe Institute and at Kulturgesch. And just uh, thank you so much for this um, wonderful opportunity. Um, I want to start by giving you some information and updates. Today is September 24th, and the 24th of September is the day of unilateral proclamation of independence in Guinea-Bissau. Yesterday, the University of Jos in Nigeria announced the first Master of Arts program in film culture and archiving studies. Last Friday, new protests began in many cities in Egypt eight years after the revolution and five years after President Sisi came to power. And last year, the Cinematheque in Angola closed down and left all the films by themselves. Now we'd like to introduce our panelists. None of them is a professional archivist, yet all of them became archivists through their artistic and or curatorial practice. Tamer Said is a filmmaker and co-founder of Cimatec Alternative Film Center in Egypt in Cairo, a multi-purpose space that provides facilities, training, and programming for the independent filmmaking community, and also built an archive that houses a, cro a growing collection of diverse film-related material. Didi Cheka, sorry in the, for the wrong order, um, is an um, off Nollywood filmmaker, a film critique, and co-founder and artistic director of Lagos Film Society, an alternative cinema center dedicated to the funding, founding of the first art house cinema in Nigeria. Funding would be nice. <laughs> He's the initiator of the archival project Reclaiming History, Unveiling Memory, in collaboration with Arsenal Institute for Film and Video Art, which I'm co-director of, Didi has launched uh, the Kasia International Film Festival of Rescued Images, which is going to open next month. 
Philippa César is an artist and filmmaker. Since 2011, she has been researching the origins of the cinema of the African liberation movement in Guinea-Bissau as a laboratory of resistance to ruling epistemologies. Her film Spell Real is the result, which you see, can see on Friday, the result of a research and digitization project that she initiated together with um, Sana Nara, who is also here with us, a filmmaker from Guinea-Bissau. Warm welcome to Sana Nara. And he will also speak a little bit later um, over a film. Um, and Flora Gomes. The resulting body of work comprises 16 millimeter films, digital archives, videos, seminars, screenings, publications, ongoing collaborations with artists, theorists, and activists. And then uh, Fradik, or Mario Bastas, is a filmmaker from Angola and an outstanding voice of Angolan cinema. In 2010, he and others set up the production company Gerasao 80. From 2010 to 2015, he worked on his first full-length documentary, Independence, about Angola's liberation struggle. The film won the Angola's Cultural National Prize for Cinema. It was recognized as a remarkable step towards recovering Angola's collective memory. When Didi Chika heard that a film archive he had stumbled over in the abandoned rooms of the old colonial film unit in Lagos might be lost, because of its state of decay, he replied, quote, if this is true, then we should reconstruct the archive based on oral history. In earlier talks, I stated that every film has at least four modes of existence. One, as you can see, the very object as it was found in the archive. Two, the film in the sum of its manifestations, which is positive and negative prints, DVDs, videotapes, different language versions, etc. Three, the film as an ephemeral object, that is its projection and the history of projections. And four, the film as discursive object, that is the memory of it, print material, stills, scripts, posters, and, as Didi pointed out, oral history. I would like to add a number five, the object as a constitutive element of the archive. How did it get there? What role does it play in the archive? What does the institutional context of the film tell us about the film, or could the film maybe tell us more about the archive in which it was found? The history of film preservation is marked by the aspiration to save the originals, a term that doesn't even appear in the above mentioned list, and to allocate them as cultural heritage in the present days. This concept is shaped by Western values, based on national statehood and defining what it is what is to be classified as cultural heritage and colonial history, and in doing so, ignoring the history of resistance, and in which context it will be passed on. Decolonial archive work has the potential to turn the, this concept upside down. Preservation can be viewed as a discourse or a socially and politically structured practice, instead of as the natural, logical way of incorporating historical moving images into contemporary life, as suggested by Caroline Frick in her book, Saving Cinema. When we speak about decolonial archive practice, we are not only talking about films from colonial archives or documents of liberation and nation building, we are talking about new ways of thinking the archive as the future. For decades, only a small number of professional archivists working for state archives in countries which could afford spending money on preserving film, usually going by the canon, had control over the worldwide film heritage. This has changed. Digitization and decolonial thinking gave voice to artists, filmmakers, curators, and activists who are now taking part in the politics of film arch archive practices. We will now present four examples four short films or film excerpts and speak about them afterwards. We will not have a huge amount of time for discussion, unfortunately, but they will give you ideas and some background for the upcoming workshop. Uh, we would like to start with uh, Tamay Said, um, who is showing a clip from the BBC documentary Egypt Today from 1982. Then uh, Fradik, then Didi, and then Philippa together with, uh, with Sana.
like a huge magnet, not just for farm produce, but for people as well. Cairo is seething with traffic and people. Lots of people travel into Cairo from the countryside every day, and many more have ended up living there permanently. About 15 million people live in Cairo. That's one in three of all Egyptians. The city has grown to bursting point with every available space taken up by buildings. One of the families which lives in this busy, crowded city is the Sobhi family. This is the youngest daughter in the Sobhi family, Amani. Amani is 10 years old. You can probably recognize the book she's reading. Winnie the Pooh is a big favorite in this house. This picture was painted by one of Amani's sisters, Amira. Amira is 17. She does about three hours of homework every day. Today, it's science. She studies hard because she wants to go to university. Amani, Amani. Madame Aida, Amani's mother, sends her to buy something at the local shop. The Sobhi family live in a flat in Heliopolis. This is an area of Cairo where the well-off Egyptians live. Amani doesn't get out of the flat very often. Her parents don't like her playing in the streets. And in Cairo, there are hardly any parks to play in. The local shop sells the same range of goods as small grocery shops in Britain. Some of the brand names are the same as well. The Sophies usually have a family meal together at six o'clock in the evening. Before the meal, Mr. Sophie says a prayer of thanks for the food. He and his family are Christians, as you can see from the pictures on the walls. About one in ten of all Egyptians are Christians. The rest are Muslims. In Egypt, the usual daily diet is bread, vegetables and pasta. But the Sophis are quite wealthy compared to most Egyptians. Mr. Sophi works as an accountant in a big company, and Madame Aida works as a librarian in a bank. So they have enough money to have meat two or three times a week. Meat would be a bit of a luxury for most Egyptian families. The Sophis have a television, a fridge, a modern cooker, and they own the flat they live in. Even so, the flat isn't very big. There are only two bedrooms. So Amira and Amani have to share a bedroom with her elder sister, Iman. In fact, the three girls share the same bed. Like most of the children from better-off families, their parents pay for them to go to a private school. Uh, um, I just wanted to make um, uh, a little explanation and very short because I promised Stephanie that it will be very short. Uh, this is definitely not the type of image that I uh, am excited about. It's just like I'm, I think it's uh, important to share it for the context of what we are talking about. And the main question that I'm thinking of all the time, like this um, <clears throat> colonial film, is it really a history? Is it now uh, something from the past or it's a mentality that uh, keeps, uh, 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 that is finding another way of practicing itself uh, in different uh, uh, disciplinaries uh, nowadays? I think this is more or less what I would like to contribute to this, uh, this, uh, this panel. I will not speak more because we have very limited time. Thank you so much. <coughs> Assim que entraram os velhos e tinha encontrado um senhor que estava de serviço, enquanto que o branco vinha de, de Portugal. Então foi o único que eles cortaram no pescoço e receberam-lhe a arma a mão, 
o mais nos admirou mesmo é que lutando as forças, coisas, estavam a abrir fogo. E quando mais fogo abriu, eles mais avançavam. E nesse dia, quer dizer, o, aqueles mais antigos da PCP ficaram guaterosos. E esse aí, Pedro Aberto e tal, pelo menos ali tomaram quatro elementos. A primeira manifestação de um grupo de fascínoras que a soldo do estrangeiro, movido por criminosos intuitos, lançava a desordem, o luto e a desolação no seio da pacífica e unida comunidade portuguesa. Depois de 4 de fevereiro, isso nos deu coragem. Nos deu mais coragem. Já ninguém podia sentir medo se amanhã vai ser apanhado ou vai ser morto. A identificação de mobilização ampliamos em todos os bairros. Estávamos unidos. Estávamos unidos. até uma coisa inesquecível esse 15 de março é, a, o dia da semana foi quarta-feira quais são as palavras? olha, as matas devem ser derribadas cada povo controlar as fazendas que está lá dividimos em um grupo quando chegou 8 horas em ponto o senhor Ferraz tocou o sino que vamos a gritar upa, 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 lumbumba, upa, 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 lumbumba. Então, como começamos a pedrejar, pedrejar bengalas e partir e, e cartanas, começamos a matar. E matar. feelings of years of repression burst forth on March 15th, the result was a bloody one. Quando veio coisa a ordem, de que olha tudo que é, que é, que é branco, deve ser morto. E as pessoas que dizer, não tinham aquele discernimento de dizer de que esta pessoa é, é, é assim ou aquela pessoa é assim. Ultimamente, as pessoas começaram a pensar, epa, por que, que se fez isso? Já tarde, mas o tudo, a hora. Mas enquanto se diz de que tudo que é da cor branca deve ser é, morto. Até alguns assimilados pretos também. Foram. Em 1961, destruiu o mito da pacífica colonização portuguesa. A revolta dos camponeses da Baixa de Caçãs foi abafada. Já os ataques em Luanda, a 4 de fevereiro, tiveram eco internacional. Mas foi a revolta iniciada a 15 de março no norte de Angola que forçou Portugal a escolher entre aceitar a nossa independência ou fazer a guerra. A explicação pode concretizar-se em uma palavra e essa é Angola. Andar rapidamente e em força é o objetivo que vai pôr à prova a nossa capacidade de decisão. O bairro estava cercado, era no Samizanga na altura, e todos tinham de sair. Estávamos todos ali eh, concentrados, assentados no chão e etc. Eles depois encontravam através dos guias que eles levavam. Então, indicando aquele, aquele, aquele. E é nessas condições que eu vou preso pela primeira vez.
That was the first sequence from um, independ uh, Independence. Now we sing the second by Friedrich. Caminho do mato, caminho da gente, gente cansada. Going to see, yeah. <laughs> now we're going to see um, saving images by Didi Cheka. It's one thing when war causes the destruction of memory, but sometimes memory dies through state sponsored forgetting. Established in 1949 as part of a drive to decentralize colonial film production, the Nigerian Film Unit was an offspring of the Colonial Film Unit. Colonial filmmakers had produced films for local audiences within Nigeria since the 1920s. In line with the framework and conventions of his parent unit, the Nigerian Film Unit continued the exhibition of health and educational films to local audiences through its fleet of mobile cinema vans and produced newsreels and short documentaries to domestic and overseas audiences. In 1965, following the end of colonial rule, the management of the unit was handled entirely by Nigerians. by the Nigerian Ministry of Information, the old film unit is now a burial site of memory. Memory is the thousands of cans of film reels in the abandoned rooms of the old film unit. Memory is faded images in black and white. is pictures with missing sounds. How do we tell our history when we migrate from our memory? How can we tell stories of who we are if we cannot save these stories?
to destroy the memory of Nigeria by Afra war and its accusation of genocide, the bloody coup and counter coup that led to war, successive military regimes that enforced collective forgetting, collective migration from memory. of its inheritance, the Nigerian state had allowed the destruction of all the physical traces of memory to make believe that nothing ever happened, nothing was ever there. Oh. Sorry, it wasn't saving images, it was saving memory, and now I pass the microphone to Philippa. Sana. Um, well, I just thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Stephanie, for including me here. And I just wanted to very shortly um, say the following. We, we um, uh, improvised a little bit the fact that uh, the panel coincided with uh, the 46, uh, 46th anniversary, anniversary of the unilateral declaration of in independence of Guinea-Bissau. We thought that we had to um, show something that was from the archive that was directly um, related to this date. That's why we improvise and we are already introducing Sun and Other today here to this panel that actually officially was supposed to be introduced tomorrow. He will be there. So, and um, I think it's um, so basically in the in the archive we uh, found a lot of. Um, uh, material that was not edited as the, the the film reel we are going to show you now that is basically the only document uh, uh, produced by guineans about this moment this very particular moment happening in the jungle of bue um, and i asked sana to um, comment the images that are mute they have no sound as most of the material in this archive and i will try to improvise i'm a very lousy translator, but I will try to, to translate a little bit to English what Sana is going to speak. You're going to speak in French or Portuguese? Vai falar em português ou em francês? Em português. He's going to speak in, in Portuguese. So... We can switch off the light. Zé, please. Thank you. Uh, o, o nosso país, uh, o Estado do nosso país nasceu há 46 anos na, 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 na mata de Guiné-Bissau. So our country was born in uh, the jungle of Guinea-Bissau uh, 46 years ago. Acabaram de ver o, o presidente da Assembleia, o vice-presidente da Assembleia, que é a mulher Carmen Pereira. You just saw the president of the first assembly, uh, Nino Vieira, and uh, Carmen Pereira, the, the vice president of the assembly. Estão a ver o grande plano de, dos deputados da Assembleia Nacional Constituinte. And you are seeing the, the deputies of the assembly, the first uh, constitutive assembly of uh, tem, the republic. Tem imagem de imprensa estrangeira, de países amigos da União Soviética, Cuba, Algeria, Guiné, Conakry, eh, Itália, França. So you have here members of the international press uh, uh, from Italy, from Russia, from different countries. So we are in, in, in inside the war, and this is happening in the jungle, in the in the uh, in the Bue jungle. Normalmente, aqui tem que ser feito no sul da frente, toda frente do sul, mas houve uma fuga de imprensa. 
tem informação. De, de, depois houve fuga de informação, por isso nós vamos fazer essa declaração de independência no leste do país. So originally this uh, event was planned to happen in the south of the country, but because there was a, a, a information, uh, how you say, uh, information that leak, leak exactly, uh, the, um, the, the it, we had to change the the, play, the plans and it moved to the le to the east of the country in Boe. Estão ver o conjunto de deputados, combatentes e dirigentes do PAJC, o partido que o Cabral fundou antes de morrer. So do you see militants of the of the PAJC party, the the the, the party that the, the liberation party that Amilcar Cabral uh, founded uh, before he died. <laughs> Acabaram de ver o presidente da esse é o, o primeiro o, o primeiro ministro da Guiné-Bissau que morreu o que está à esquerda é o primeiro ministro de Cabo Verde, o presidente de Cabo Verde em seguida portanto a história do, do nosso país estava a nascer há 46 anos nesse momento So we saw, just saw before the, the, uh, uh, Pedro Pires, the first president of Cape Verde and so we are see, seeing here the first moments of um, Guinean's nation independent nation Portanto, é hoje exatamente o 46 anos. Ah, Esse é o primeiro presidente da Guiné-Bissau. So this is, this is just uh, 46 years ago, exactly in this same day, and uh, before you just saw the Luís Cabral, the first president of uh, Guiné-Bissau. Aquilo estava a acontecer no leste do país, porque é, nós fomos todos, de, de todas as frentes de luta para, para, para esse local, na, na, no, no leste do país, para evitar sermos bombardeados. So we, we, we ca all came from different fronts of uh, guerrilla struggle to this place uh, in a very uh, secret process uh, and, and gathered for only one day here uh, for this event. Depois disso, voltamos todos para para diferentes frentes para continuar a luta para para tomar a independência um ano depois. So all this, all this, uh, uh, after all this ev an event, we all went again to the different uh, fronts to continue the armed struggle, and uh, uh, only the the independence um, was only happening one year later. The, the the I mean the end of the war, so only happening one one year later. Os deputados estavam, esse é o presidente de, de, de Cabo Verde, que era o presidente que substituiu que Cabral à frente do PJZ, Aristide Pereira. So, Aristide Pereira was the, the person that substituted Cabral after he was killed in the, can I say, the 20th of January of 1973, just uh, half a year before, uh, before this, this event. Estava o presidente da Guiné-Bissau a falar, a cumprimentar o presidente do partido. So this is the first uh, Guinean president, uh, Luís Cabral, uh, greeting uh, the, the, the president of the PAGC. O, a nosso, o nosso país acabava de nascer há 46 anos. So the, the, the country was born 46 years ago, exactly in this moment. Esses são os deputados que vieram de diferentes frentes, que estavam sentados, de, de, cada um representava um o grupo representava cada região que representava na Assembleia Nacional Constituinte. So all the, these people you see were deputies that were rep representing each regions of the of the country. Mas o país inteiro estava ainda em guerra. But the whole country was still at war against uh, Tugas, the Portuguese. Uh, Luís Cabral é o primeiro presidente da Guiné-Bissau. Yeah. Luís Cabral, the first president of Guinea-Bissau. Então, o nosso cinema estava a nascer nesse momento. O nosso the, cinema our, da Guinea-Bissau uh, também estava a nascer. <laughs> our cinema was also being born here in this moment, not only the country. This is Otto Schacht. <laughs> a German a Guinean vice president of the Assembly National Popular. He was the vice president of the Assembly. Uh, no, uh, Carmen Pereira was the vice president of the Assembly of the National uh, Assembly. This was the first minister of the interior. 
He was the Minister of Inter Internal Affairs. Es fue cuando se fue de una frente norte, el exterior, se fue de una frente norte. Es un diputado de la población. Es un hombre que es diputado de la población. Es el Chica Vaz. Es un diputado, una diputada. Sorry, I missed, but that was Chica Vaz, one of the deputies. And the other ones, yeah, I can't. Es un combatiente diputado. So they were all guerrilla people also having all these roles of... Es un hombre de la población que falló en nombre de todos los diputados en representación de la población de Guinea Bissau. Mut Nassambu. He was the rep representing, um, he was a deputy representing everybody, all the territories of Guinea Bissau. Como dice, las pancartas representan las regiones donde ven los diputados. So the, all these uh, groups uh, represent its area territory of Guinea-Bissau. Es el primero, el primero, el primero de la asamblea, el presidente de la asamblea representante de Guinea-Bissau, uh, el que estaba a hablar. Nino, Nino Vieira was the, the president of the assembly, the, the Bernardo uh, Vieira. I just want to add something in English, if I can. Uh, from th this moment, basically changed the situation of the old war, because from um, uh, a colonial country that was uh, having all these uprisings of terrorists, as the Portuguese would put it, tr was transformed into an uh, independent country that was occupied by the Portuguese. So there was a, sw a swap of situation through this event. Thank you, Sana. Thank you so much. Thank So you could, um, I think with this uh, selection of films and excerpts, you could see that we are speaking about a lot. We are speaking about documents um, and different kind of documents, those um, um, telling the narrative of uh, the colonialists and, and others um, who um, speak from the perspective, perspective of resistance. But we speak also, um, and this uh, is something I would like to address in the beginning, about practices, um, uh, practices in which, um, with which you are, um, or we are using um, those documents or working or approaching those documents. And um, the question will be whether um, the documents exist at all without those practices. And um, I would like um, to ask the first question to all of you. Um, all of you are artists or filmmakers who confronted with colonial history and politics and, um, and uh, as well as um, uh, the history of resistance and archival documents um, turned into curators and or archivists. Could you describe your journey in relation to the images we just saw? What motivated you, and how did you have? Um, um, how did those images, in, in which way, have uh, have an impact on your artistic um, work or, or curatorial work and, and choices? Um, I mean, very clearly we saw um, the way Philippa you decided to digitize the images by showing um, the the. Preparation preparation um, of the film material, to, sh to expose the material, and to have a, a live reading of the images and so on. And I think all of you have different things to say about that. Who wants to begin? Tema? Uh, hello. Um, so, uh, I mean, I don't know if we have time, but we... <laughs> <laughs> Now we have time. <laughs> yes, we. Um, so basically, I I I see myself as a filmmaker in the first place. I mean, I and then all other practices come from this uh, passion to to work with the image and to 
to uh, to um, to play with sound and image. And I I remember that when I started to work long time ago, like many, many years ago, I asked myself one question. Like, I see that the world is producing many, many, many images. And I asked myself, do we need more images? Uh, don't we have enough? And um, basically, this question is a question that I keep asking myself every time I'm trying to produce a new image. So. Of course, like in the process of founding Cinematech and, 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 and making my film and this thing of how to use the image and in which context you frame it was, uh, uh, was, um, was something that was chasing me all the time. And one of the things, and that's why also I, I, I picked this, this clip, because I feel like um, occupation is not only occupying the land, it's also occupying the screen or occupying the narrative. And don't allow people to tell their stories or like allow or tell the stories about the people in a way that doesn't really uh, uh, um, reflect uh, um, how they, they, they see themselves. And I ask myself this question also, to which extent like when we produce, when we make films or music or 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 or, or theatre or any type of form, to which extent this art that we produce is challenging the stereotype versus creating these stereotypes about the others, and this is uh, I think uh, a question that we we should all ask ourselves. Then, through the process of making the film, especially in the in the last nine years, starting from the Egyptian Revolution in 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 2011, there was this. Uh, also, I witnessed this uh, um, two years after the revolution, when everybody wanted to have images from Tahrir Square, thinking that uh, a revolutionary film is a film that is filming the revolution. And not to 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 to, and 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 it's not about revolting against the the um, the, the classical way of using the image and sound. So for me, I see this kind of the concept of colonial film is a mentality. It's 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 a way of how we look at things and how we design things. And it's not only about producing a film. And it's not an era that is ended. It's 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 something that comes again and again in every practice we do with with, with film and sound. In 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 in, in programs, in festivals, in 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 um, in, um, in writing, in producing new images and and in a way, I, I see that the work we need to do is to, to, it's not to resist this kind of image. It's more like to, to take the, this form of art to another place. Films are not made to, to transfer information or to tell people something. Films are made to to uh, to share questions and i think we we through different practices we kind of rooted this uh, way of looking at films that is basically uh, uh, making the, the the viewer kind of uh, um, processing films from this position of trying to understand uh, something about the others from uh, from the image which is not uh, could you add one sentence about um, the reason why you are um, building a something that I would call a counter archive at Cimatec in Cairo? Hmm. I, I, I think it's also because, like, I because I, I I think it's very important for us to. Um, I mean, first of all, we we exist in um, the, the the context in in Egypt is. Uh, is also it's it's a country that doesn't we, we have a national archive but we it's not accessible. So I think like if we if you cannot access your archive if you cannot access your history you won't be able to see the future. I, I always think that the only way to, to see the future is looking 
to the, 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 the past. And uh, I mean, Didi has a very uh, beautiful way of seeing it. So, uh, um, and I, so that was one of the reasons. The other thing thing is we 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 see that there is actually a very uh, a huge material of marginalized uh, 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 films that that comes from amateurs and, and 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 people who who were not supported by the state or by any other uh, body and they produced images that can tell you something about the the situation that is very different i think we 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 see in our, we see archive as a way of engaging with the reality and it's it's a way of engaging the people with the reality so it's a kind of um uh, uh, a process and of communication that is non-stop and i uh, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm just like I'm, I know that we have very limited time. So. Stop saying it all the time. It's just, wait, don't waste the time. Right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Do you want to continue? Or? Yes, I, I, I really like to say something. Um, actually, I'm happy that we have uh, the image of a, a real in the back and not uh, colonial memory. Also, because I think it's a very unilateral idea. Because uh, what we saw before and uh, commented by Sana. It's not a colonial memory, it's a, a memory of uh, struggle, of resistance. And I think it's important to acknowledge this because it, um, it is a difference. It, you know, like the people that struggle in Guinea-Bissau, they never think about a colonial memory. They, it's about, about 500 years of resistance and struggle and, um, and revolution. And uh, so it's... It's you know so I think this is an important issue to also to discuss how our words also are loaded with a certain position from where you speak and what are you speaking about. So uh, we in this um, in the in the in, I'm just saying that this because it's important also for the project we did uh, with Sana in, and Flora Gomez and Suleiman Bi and many 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 other people with Stephanie Schulterstradaus because we the 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 Guinean the the what we tried to do it from the moment we understood that and the the the, the Guinean archive and the the film material that was stored in Guinea was not going to be um, was not um, relevant enough for um, Western institutions to be uh, invested in, to be part of a of so-called history with big H. From the moment we understood that this is not going to happen, we had to understand that to um, rescue that uh, imaginary of liberation, we would have to have, uh, to use methods, uh, militant methods ourselves and not the methods that are the Western methods. So basically, this was um, something that uh, preoccupied us a lot. And, um, and we were not professional archivists. We were all artists or thinkers or um, people preoccupied with this uh, situation. Or militants like Sana, that is a, the real guerrilla filmmaker here. <laughs> And so, uh, and this is also the place where I find my voice here. And it's the place of someone uh, that joins a struggle of, uh, of um, create or, or of um, um, channeling uh, uh, an imaginary that is in the verge of um, complete uh, disappearance. And and um, I'm I'm saying this because um, this would this was not. Um, a process of um, institutional, uh, it was a, com a very experimental process, uh, actually from um, some um, specialist uh, perspective of film archivists, it's a failed project. It's considered to be a failed project. And um, so this, and the idea was to uh, look at, uh, at the material as material, as an, as an inscription, as a body of inscription, um, as uh, as many other bodies, of, you know, there's many other forms of inscribing uh, resistance, you know, from oral history, from the songs, from cloth uh, weaving, from, you know, there is very, very forms of inscribing um, 
these uh, codes, you know, various forms of codes. So this, so we we, we start looking at this archive as a form of as a, an inscribed body that. Um, uh, uh, which also the this decay so the for, the fact that the film uh, reels were also decomposing and there was a kind of a bio, uh, biology of the archive as well not only an archaeology uh, was also part of of the surface and not only you know the attempt of going to a, an original you know status of the image so all these things were were um, were preoccupying us, like what, what, how, what is the method to um, to um, channel this imaginary? Uh, so this is, and it's very complex, and it took us a long time. It was, uh, yeah, and uh, it made us, uh, it connected us a lot. It connected a lot of people uh, interested in 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 thinking about this. And and um, and of course, and it's important that Sana will have a voice here tomorrow, uh, because uh, from one side is this perspective of what happened there and how these images help to 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 reconnect with this moment, and that from the other side is the politics of history making, and who who has the right, who has the power, who has the the means to produce uh, the, what it's going to be the future history. And I just wanted to add this, but it's complex. Um, just one thing, because you, uh, because um, because this practice of um, having Sana speaking over the images is also something we see in Spell Reels, something that you did a lot in many events uh, while the making of the film, and the which went hand in hand with the digitization of the archive. Um, and uh, I think this is a very direct interacting with, with the images. Um, and um, uh, and Didi, um, we had uh, this, by the way, this reel was the first film reel that back then Didi still had to steal from the shelves. Um, now things have changed. Um, as I said in the beginning, the um, University of Jaws is now, because Didi found this film reel, is now opening a master study program on film archiving only five years later after you found this, thanks to your incredible efforts. <laughs> and um, and and I remember when we um, when we saw um, um, the films, how people who were there to actually um, watch what we were doing, but also talking over these films or describing what they saw in the images in a very beautiful way. Did he? Um, the, the other thing is that uh, as an archival practitioner from Todd Cinema, there is really no way you can talk about cinema memory or even political memory from your country without colonial memory. It stands right there in our front. So, and of course, our archival practice in a way oftentimes have to resist it. Not oftentimes necessarily have to resist it. Like um, Stephanie hinted, I got on board this archival journey by accident. Because ever since UNESCO in 2007 said that Nigerian cinema had out, outstripped in output the United States and was second only to India in output, Nollywood, which is how the Nigerian movie industry is dubbed, has become a subject of international academic study. But there has not been any attempt to, to research what went on before. It looked as if Nigeria started, Nigeria started making film in 1992. So we decided, me and a couple of critics, as, a, as an off Nollywood filmmaker and a film critic, we decided to found an institution dedicated to the, to the founding of the first art house cinema in Nigeria that is not pro Nollywood oriented or even Hollywood cinema. So we inher inherited this old colonial building that goes back to the 40s and 50s in the heart of Lagos State, the main commercial city of Nigeria. It, it has an old, rustic cinema, not like this. It's just, yes, on the, but it has got a screen. And we began screening, throwing images on the screen. For one year, we were there for one year, and then we said, but we just came and took over this place. What is behind the building, this whole building? What else is there? Maybe we have been living here with ghosts. <laughs> and we, for one year, we didn't know. So 
course. So we decided to investigate this big building, and the gate was broken in the buildings at the back. So we just walked in, and there was this strong overpowering smell, which we didn't know. I'm not an archivist. I'm just a, uh, an, a filmmaker. And so we stumbled into this room, and it was, you saw three rooms. The first room we saw was like a graveyard. It was, but instead of human beings, you have film reels scattered all around, and then you saw them on shelves. And, and it was, wow. What process of forgetting triggered this mass burial of what was supposed to be materials of memory and history in, in this country? How, how come nobody had talked about this? And, Importantly, to what are in these films? They were all rusty, it was difficult to open them. And the challenge actually was, when we saw the first scan so bad, was that what if they were all like this? These hundreds of film cans stacked like this you saw on the screen. What if not one single one of them could be rescued? How can we now say we have lost our memory because we never saw these images, we never heard the sound, so we never knew what was in them. How can you talk about something that was never yours as being lost? And it was the, it, this was central to my conversation with Stephanie, and I said, well, the most important thing is really not the restoration of these images. I think they are important. I really want to see what are in these images. I really want to rescue them, but if we cannot rescue them, we can have a conversation about what we are in these images. We could construct oral history. In my Nigerian society in Africa, we say that when an old man dies, an entire library burns down. This is what it means in Africa back, back then because of our history is usually, was mostly oral history. And so you have this old grill who are reciting family, not just family history, but the entire history of the community. From the very beginning, history and memory in my society has never been personal, it has always been collective. So when you lose one, what affects you also affects the community. And the country that sprang up from my society has inherited this whole building of history and memory and has not narrated it to coming generations the way our forefathers narrated what has happened before when there was no cinema. Our, we have narrated this history and now nobody, there is cinema, these images have been captured and nobody have narrated them to us. And this was our point of entry into this, into this archive that goes back a long way. It was originally a colonial archive because the British, cinema began in Nigeria because the British set up the colonial film unit which of course later became the federal film unit. So it was the British colonial power who was, who was producing images of us. So, of course, without permission. So these images were there, which we also inherited from them. And when I stumbled upon them, there was government inactivity. When we first asked them that, oh, look, we have seen this thing, we want to intervene, and they said, what are you asking? Are you asking us for money? We said, no, we are not asking for money. We said, they said, because we don't have money to give you. I said, no, I don't want money. I just want to see uh, what is in there. We look for money by ourselves. And this was how we got on board, on board this. So there are two opposition. And this actually forms my point of entry into archival practice. <coughs> There is colonial filmmaking in this, inst in this sense of post-colonial, post-colonial, post-colonialism. Now I resist that theory because every African intellectual and scholar is always talking about post-colonialism after Fano, after Said, and nobody is challenging it. Post-colonialism is, it gives the impression that the most important, the only important thing that has happened to African cinema, is, to African history, is colonialism. So every other thing after 1960 is immaterial in this discussion of African cinema and memory. And using this stuff, we say, so how could we now use these images that was produced by colonialism? How could we now repurpose these images to let the subaltern speak? So we can say, oh, this is your interpretation of these images, but we can repurpose it. This is also our interpretation of these images. So, that is on the one hand. On the other hand was what I think, what I use in counterposing post-colonialism, post-war, the Nigerian war of 1967 to 1970. It was this war that led the Nigerian government to abandon the archive. The British, good or bad, kept a working archive, even if it was colonial images, they handed a working archive to Nigeria, 
and then the Nigerian government, because of the war, because of the pogrom and the accusations of genocide and the military coups and the assassination, decided to continue photographing itself from 1960 to 1967 to 1980. They continue photographing themselves, but they were no longer presenting it to the public. They were keeping it in the old building they inherited from the colonial powers, and nobody was getting ac ha had access to these buildings. So, on the one hand, you have the you have the, the you have the dominant theory of post-colonialism of the of decolonizing the archival, which hopefully in the coming days we are going to have some discussion and debate about what it actually means to decolonize the archive and for who and by who. So the what I oppose to the dominant theory of colonial memory and all that is within Nigeria itself, the the factors that led us to migrate from from memory. It is really the 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 war of nineteen sixty seven which nobody is talking about, which confronts us with a difficult problem in dealing with this archive. What if we encounter images and they are in the archive? What if we encounter images from that troublesome political period? How do we continue practicing working and trying to extend and challenge the boundaries, the common boundaries of working with institutional archives? So this Forms my, this is actually the center of my archival practice, and hopefully, in the course of in the, in the other, maybe now and also tomorrow, we are going to have to broaden the, uh, the conversation and uh, try to push it a little bit uh, further and see what comes out of it. There are no cut and dried answer originally. What is permanent is the, what where I stand from, where I proceed from, is as a resistance to the theory of post-colonialism post as the dominant factor that drives memory and history in Africa using these archives. So, yeah. Uh, well, uh, for me, uh, the, the the part, the clip that you guys saw was from a film that I did, Independencia. And uh, one of the reasons we made this film was because as an Angolan, we never saw our story told by us in a film and with archive footage edited by us in a film. So that was one of the reasons we, we were part of that, of that project. And we chose that particular clip here to show because that is that, that propaganda song that the Portuguese regime did in 1961 in response to the first uprisings uh, by our people. And the song was Angola is ours. And in the archives, that song was normally played with uh, beautiful images of Portuguese living in Angola, playing tennis, going to the theater, um, having like a happy life. Mm -hmm. And and for me, when, when I saw that image, uh, it kind of came into sort of a shock, uh, seeing how they they really thought the country was theirs. And, and they never showed the other side. The propaganda films never showed the other side especially colonial propaganda films. Mm -hmm. So the idea was to cut together the same song, but with the other side and with the people that we interview, which was another important element in the, in the whole process. We, we interviewed uh, about 700 people uh, in this project to start building our own archive, made our oral stories. Mm -hmm. And because we thought it was important as well, but at the same time, it's the whole process of dealing with the archives, and it was uh, like the film has like 38 minutes of archive footage, and he only has one minute of archive in a, from Angola. Mm -hmm. Everything else <laughs> came from Portugal, England, United States, Belgium, Romania, mm -hmm. France. What was this minute? The minute was, and actually it was a minute that I made sure uh, I wanted to, to be from Angola. It was, it's the moment where uh, we declare independence. Mm -hmm. And actually it was one of those decisions, when you watch the film, it's kind of off sync, because that's how bad the footage oh, is. Yeah. And I actually had a good footage from, from Portugal, but I said, no, at least this minute I'm going to use from our archive. <laughs> and, and, and I think it's going to be important here uh, this week to talk about 
how how we as filmmakers uh, deal with archives as well, because one thing that I always try to mention, especially when I'm in here in Portugal and I talk with other filmmakers that are looking for archives as well, mm. is that the, the archive that asked us for the highest price for this film was the national TV from Portugal, RTP. And the archives this, that charges zero for it was the military in Portugal. Mm -hmm. So they understood what the film meant, they understood they should not charge for it, and, and it was interesting also how, how hard it is for a filmmaker from like, from Angola or even Nigeria, mm -hmm. you go look in an archive in Europe and sometimes you try to look for, you know, Angolan freedom fighters and you can't find it. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to find Angolan freedom fighters footage, you have to look Angolan terrorists because that's how it was labeled. And you spend hours and then you have to put on the mindset mm -hmm. of who archive it and to find that footage. And that's really weird. <laughs> so. Uh, I hope with this week and we can talk about it and, and, and discuss more about that, those issues. Yeah. I think what, um, what I find interesting is that I feel that the film archiving has a similar, or there's a parallel to actually film production in many ways, um, in, in that sense that, uh, I mean, Tema, you said earlier, why would you as a filmmaker create even more images if there are already so many? And I often think in terms of film digitization, the same thing is happening. The established archives or the big state archives with money often reproduce <laughs> the canon over and over and over. And um, uh, whereas also other films, uh, yeah. even including uh, maybe films that would you would call it like uh, the counter cinema, um, often, or not often, but sometimes can be digitized and then they, they end up in a, in a shelf and are still not seen. Um, so um, I think what was clear from all your presentations is that um, dealing with those archives, um, or different archives, uh, needs, as you described, um, Philippa, um, uh, also a guerrilla archiving practice, kind of. Um, mm -hmm. For example, uh, to, to make it very concrete, um, uh, Philippa, uh, who I think was the first one among those here, who uh, at yes. least the three of you, started digitizing the footage. Um, you worked, she worked with a, um, a corn manufacturer, a very small company in Berlin with one person only who donated his scanner because he knew he was working on a new model and this would be kind of destroyed. No, two people, one for Jesus. Two people, sorry. <laughs> um, and the scanner, the material of Guinea Bissau was in such bad, bad condition that the scanner would really suffer from it, but he, he did that. And then the, and then uh, Cimatec got the same scanner model from the same person and now uh, the same model um, which unfortunately has a name Edeltraut is in, um, <laughs> also in Nigeria. Yeah. Um, but this is only possible because of those um, um, uh, really underground practices and the, and the incredible support of individuals. Um, and uh, so it seems to me there is a parallel to film production, and I think you experienced um, similar things, that you have to create a counter kind of business. Um, mm -hmm. of, uh, not a counter, or, yeah, counter parallel, I mean a parallel word mm -hmm. um, in, in the business of, of, of archival work. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, would you say, um, how, is there, uh, how, what, would, what should the established institutions um, uh, learn from, from those practices? Or what is, what is the main um, um, problem uh, that you face um, when you work, for example, with uh, trying to get um, footage from um, um, other places? <coughs> I mean, we, we like like many problems, of course. Like, I mean, from one side, I mean, I think like the 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 example that you 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 said is just like also uh, reflecting this uh, this mentality and also the I would say the misuse of the um, of the resources because you know you see that there is one film there digitized. Uh, 20 times in different places, while other films that are just like the smelling because no one is 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 taking care of them, and 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 I think, I mean, first of all, every image is important. Every image from the history is important, and every image 
has a story and this story can be seen uh, differently in different contexts and in different places and at different times. So who has the, the, the power to decide if this image is more important than this one? In which context and in which time? Because what we think is not important today maybe is very important in a few decades. So this decision of preserving a, a certain image is not only a decision for us, it's, it's, a, decision, it's, a, it's a decision also for the next generations. Uh, because definitely we are, there are some images that we will lose forever. Uh, because with everything we did over the last, I would say 30, 40, 50 years, what, what is digitized is less than 10% or 5% of what we produced over all uh, the history of cinema. The other thing is, as you, as you said, is you know, when the institution is, is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, then the process of uh, decision making and the process of how you categorize this archive and how you deal with it is a huge thing. I remember that we had this, uh, um, we had this uh, story when, when we showed some um, parts of the colonial films about the Arab region, from the Arab region from the beginning of the uh, uh, 20th centuries, like 19, between 1900 and 1915. And um, that was from the collection of the BFI. And then I, I was speaking to the, I saw the, the images and, and, and one thing was that I was so shocked how these images that was made very long time ago, like, like more than a century, more than 100 years ago, is still the main reference for any image that is produced in big films, for example, in Hollywood, when it comes to our region. Like, you know, it was, it was done in a moment when th that was the only source of information. There were some travelers moving around the world. Mm -hmm. And then, like, for example, if you look at a souk uh, scene in any big film in Hollywood, you will see that it's still taking these images as a reference, as if the world is still there, as, as if people never travel, as if there's no internet, as if they didn't even do the minimum effort of just Googling mm -hmm. the, the new images from this, uh, this uh, so, so So this is, this is uh, an important uh, issue. And then when I speak to, the, to, the, to, the, to them and ask, like, if I want to look at these images, if I want to use them, I was shocked by the, the, the money that I have to pay. So for example, and then I said, so like I said to, 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 to like 100 years ago, someone came and, 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 and shot my, my grandfather. And then I want to use the picture of my grandfather and then I have to pay for it. He didn't ask my grandfather if he, if he wants to be portrayed or not, and, 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 and then now he, he asked me to pay yeah. to use the picture of my grandfather. It's, uh, yeah. um, there's uh, like the, the reason why we showed the second excerpt of your film, um, um, Fadik, is that uh, there's uh, the, the materiality that you show, that you make very transparent, uh, which is something that, that you also um, do, Philippa, in, in, in your work. And um, so that makes sure that there is a very subjective, like a very, um, it's transparent, yes, but then there's also like a very clear artistic um, hand writing in, in, in the image, or, or, or let's say, um, it's a very personal, uh, you make your position very clear, very visible by that. And that is, um, I would say, the opposite of um, what um, usually um, archives always um, uh, uh, found the most important thing, which, which is objectivity in, in film digitization restoration. The, the idea that you could do that in a very objective way, that you could really restore film the way it used to be, and you have objective criteria for that. Um, that leads then, and this is actually related to the question before very much, Philippa, to something like failure, that somebody tells you that your project was a failure. In what sense? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, 
it, it depends on uh, the, the concept you have of what is failure, what is success. No? Yeah. Like uh, for me, in the, in this very context, maybe it was even a compliment for us. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I just uh, I think one thing that was mentioned here in in relation to this, I will come, I will arrive there yeah. to the materiality is the 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 the, the economical, uh, you know, the, the the situation of of I, mean, I think for example, Sana used to say to me, actually uh, the, the the fact that this country being so poor uh, economically, it has been actually protecting it, but at the same time, um, this kind of um, the the lack of interests, you know, like. Uh, Economic interests in the in the country also makes that a situation of it. So it was very difficult to find, mm -hmm. as you know, um, uh, uh, means for this for this, and basically also difficult to find means to treat this archive in uh, the standard of um, how film archivists, you know, like work in uh, in state archives. Basically, you would need, you know, like we we we. Digitized. We never say recovered or restored because it's we digitized the moment. We used to say like we we documented the moment of that very moment that we encountered the material in that day. No, it was the day before was different. The day after would be different. So we documented that very moment of the situation of that material. Yeah. And um, and in an, in another context, you would have to have uh, you know like millions to to first clean, then um, uh, rest, uh, um, how you say uh, restore the material, and then uh, bring it to a state you know like where it can then finally be digitized. And uh, we didn't have these means at all, so we had almost no means, and um, the the. So that's why I said like how the the, the, the material the, the content of the material was we, we were trying to find uh, a method that mirrors the content of that struggle you know without the secrecy like Sana, Sana was saying like we had to trick the Portuguese to make the the you know to swap you know the situation of the war by going to another place where I think we are in that uh, area and we go to the other so we had to trick this and and in a way we had to say okay, this is condemned forever. Um, uh, we tried, you know, FIAF. We tried, you know, institutions even in this country, to and um, and and then we had we had these really like you know meetings, you know, in Berlin. There was really like Karu Faraki, you know, like Avi Mogravi, you know, like film militant filmmakers, you know, coming together, and then uh, that brought me to you, you know, like to say like, okay, this is the situation. What we have here. What are the what can we do? You know, so basic was like strategy, you know, like, and then uh, that's when Arun Faraki brought us to this technician. He heard that there was someone that was developing a specific um, uh, scanner, a, a very simple scanner that one had one particular thing that none of the professional scanners from Ari had. That was the fact that it could just move the material like that, so it was not dependent on the perforation. So it was uh, moving the material like that, and had a, a laser that would detect the position of the, the perforation. This means that uh, material like that, that w when it comes to this state, it shrinks, it gets dry, you know, like the vinegar syndrome attacks, and the, there's a decomposition process, so the material shrinks, and the p position of the of the perforation is different, so it never gets into the proper into the into the hook. the hooks. So if he, he was, tr you know, he was working on this first prototype and and that had this specific uh, uh, so he was thinking about the material that could exactly uh, d digitize material in this in a very very advanced state of decay and when when um, Harun brought us together with Rainer Meyer and he was so fascinated by the project we had made little photographs of this of steel so we knew more or less what is inside and we were like when we were identifying them with Flora and Sana, were, and so he said, like, okay, let's let's. I'm I'm, I'm really up to do to use the Guinean project as this kind of like first uh, uh, as a as a uh, first experiment for myself. So basically, there was many people experimenting on on things that they have never <laughs> worked, and. Um, 
And from the moment he said that he could also, he was not dependent on the perforation, so he could also work digitize the, the old material, we said, okay, we prefer that because uh, the, the film, you know, the information that is also in the film reels, like if it's a Norvo film, uh, re film, uh, film reel, or if it's um, the film material, if, where it comes from, you know, if it's a Kodak or a Fuji or a Orvo. Orvo was a East German uh, uh, film, uh, company uh, producing film material stock. And so there was all these um, elements, and we also had the, 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 the soundtrack, often not in these films but in, in other films optical sound and magnetic sound so basically we were like okay we want to document the whole thing as an object itself and uh, and we accept the the scratches the decadence the the, the fungus on it the the, the 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 situation as it is and it became a, a method not only like we are doing this because we cannot do it better because we have no means to do it better but this became also uh, we uh, uh, a method that we were because we thought you know the, the the fact that film is in Africa you know in conditions in a places that there is no electricity uh, there is no fridges there's no you know like it also tells the, uh, it also tells something that it also tells information about the material itself and also you know this material was also thrown away during the, the war in ninety eight. Uh, recovered again by the filmmakers. Uh, so basically, all of that was part of the, this inscription. So I'm just saying this because the, the interesting thing is that the fact that it became this, and there's also a very important a Christian Klagas that was also a Goethe Institute person in Dakar that uh, was super important, that was also very enthusiastic about this project and helped us to get the funding from the, the foreign affairs. I mean, the little funding that helped us a lot. But I actually, I, I found the, the image beautiful. Like, I was very yeah, surprised yeah. by the quality mm -hmm. of the image. It was really, really, it's very well digitized. Yeah, and well, later, and well later, later yes. also brought, you know, like, yes. Heine developed the next I, scanner and so yeah. on. Yes, yeah. Can I ask Radik uh, uh, to, to say also a few words about um, your decision to show the materiality of film in, in some sequences? Uh, well, the decision came because... Uh, as a filmmaker, I love films, and and once I, I started uh, with this project, I discovered that I love archives. I, not only film archives, but photographs, letters, books, whatever is old, I love it. <laughs> because uh, I discovered that just like films, uh, every object uh, tells kind of a story. Like you said, the sidelines of a film is telling a story where it came from, who wore the alliances, where the film was coming from, and uh, the state, how the film is, the same thing. So I decided with the film, show that kind of process that I went through almost for the, the three years that uh, we were doing the most of the post-production, which is visiting a lot of archives, you know, dealing with film reels, with old papers. So I wanted to show you know, where those stories kind of came from. Of course, in the film we have a very strong presence of people talking, because that's the new archive we're, type, we're, we're trying to build, an archive uh, made out of people, because, uh, and that's, that's one of the things that I think it's rare for us, because if you talk about countries in Europe, when they started was like centuries ago. So our countries, in terms of independence, they started like 40 years ago. So, and the people who started, they were right there. So uh, the whole thing was to give focus to them. And at the same time, I knew they were gonna become an archive. We, I was talking with Felipe, it's like, this is the film that I probably, I'm gonna watch everyone die. Like most of the people, not most of the people, mm -hmm. but like, 12 people, at least from the project, already died. So one died last week, actually. Yeah, yeah. So every time I see, it's like, well, there's another one. So for, for us, it was very important to show the people and at the same time to show how, you know, mm. how they should be imprinted to an archive as well. You know I mean? They, they, they are the archive now they are the for archive. us. Yeah. I also want to say something about the materiality of the film. I, I never understood why, because you know this this very long process of 
restoring the the um, the, the the film and trying to um, um, deal with the like uh, erase every scratch and clean everything. Mm-hmm. In the end, I've seen many films that. When you look at it, you think it's 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 a digital film. It's not it's not uh, celluloid anymore, because you know this process of stabilizing everything and making everything so. In a way, it's even against the 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 the, the, stat- the static of the celluloid. It's it's as if you you make everything perfect, and it lost the 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 the, the, the spirit of of the, of the material itself because. The, like you know, mm-hmm. that was part of of the of the of the material also that we we should protect. Mm-hmm. So um, I think actually our time is over. But do we have time for one or two questions from the audience? I hate uh, closing a panel without asking, inviting the audience to also say something or ask something over there. Yes, please. You have to thank. You. Um, my question is about uh, how, as filmmakers, you sort of bear the responsibility and the power and privilege that comes with handling these archives, and then how you choose to disseminate them or kind of the reach that your film has, because sort of particularly in Portugal, these are obviously still quite niche, quite small debates that should be had, and looking around the room, there's sort of still a very particular demographic, and I don't think it's due to lack of interest, but rather the fact that everyone has sort of a responsibility to kind of make these debates wider debates, mainstream debates, because there's still so much youth that has grown up with these memories uh, from their grandparents and their parents, but they don't have access to sort of um, this information and these archives, and also the whole Portuguese population, there's such a big issue with conciliating the colonial and the violent Pass um, that the country has. So yeah, sort of my question is, how do you bear the responsibility of um, your films, of them having a greater reach? Uh, well, for us, um, uh, one of the the main reasons we did, like, when you're making a film nowadays, people always lo- like to talk about who's the audience, who are you making this film for, and <laughs> for us was. We're making the film, first of all, for the people that participated uh, during our struggle, and at the same time, we're doing the film for our generation. So it's not choosing a particular group of people, and the responsibility for us was more to share with those people and, and make them talk with each other. So the idea with the film was, you know, the, the grandfather, the father, it goes back home and is able to talk and the, the son or the granddaughter can ask a question about how was it? Tell me. Because the, the idea was like the film is just the beginning of a conversation. And, and of course, uh, being a filmmaker, a young filmmaker from, from Angola, trying to tell a story that was 40 years ago, it's my parents' generation, uh, where the, the, the main... Uh, the main speech uh, is was the the main government the MPLA. It was kind of a lot of a lot of kind of pressure over me, like oh my god, I'm I'm gonna do something wrong, or you know I'm gonna affect someone, and and a lot of people ask me back home. The, one of the main questions is, were you censored to to talk about anything? And I said never. The biggest censor for me doing this film was myself because. I was born with just one side of the story. I was born that you know the older generation speaks first and you speak later. So the biggest censor was me, and I think one of my biggest challenge was you know to cut down like any censorship I had telling this story and you know going forward. And sometimes it's like, and I and I'm kind of sort of inspired mm-hmm. what Didi uh, uh, has done and Philippa as well. It's like. I was telling them our Cinematheque was closed last year, and the archives at the Cinematheque of Angola are just like Didi found Mm -hmm. uh, the archives in Nigeria, and they're just there. And so I think one of the main things I'm gonna do when I get back home is go there and take it. (laughs) Because if no one is telling the story, if no one is doing anything to save the archives, you know, the responsibility 
it has you have to take responsibility for it you know it's you can't wait I mean I can give you an example of that for example when when we were um, preparing for the digitalization there was someone from the state that came up through you know like and show up and say no 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 nobody takes this this is actually ours and then it was very interesting how Sun and Flora came up and said no no this is not this is not state material anymore I mean it's not what they say now again but in that moment uh, they said no this is found footage we found this material thrown away by the state on the streets. Mm. So we found it and took it. So mm. it's not yours anymore. You know, like, so how to mm. re, you know, you can give, you can use um, the rhetorics in mm. order to re recover the power that is being taken by you in, in mm. that moment. Of course, now they, they, you know, they, they, it's, it's a national archive. Mm. But in that very moment, uh, there was a moment of like, you know, power again and mm. uh, wanting to get power over mm. you and mm. take take advantage of that so there was so there was like and we did this in the whole process like how you can use rhetorics and also change in order to recover you know like empower yourself mm. or the people you know like so but the question our question is very important and actually I would like to inter to answer it when we show spell real because it's it, you know like the question of privilege and the question of uh, you know you, you produce something with a certain uh, that you produce value, you produce uh, an object that has value and you have access and all these things. This is wonderful, but very, I would love to answer this if you are here in, in uh, because it's a long uh, answering. Uh, it's an, uh, we, we, we discuss it a lot in the process of doing, for example, Spell Real. And, uh, you know, like, for example, sharing all the prices, uh, actually not sharing, actually like sending the money to Guinea for filmmaking, for example, using a politics of the privilege that comes out of this collective process and also crediting, collective crediting and not, you know, not a one filmmaker this, does, does this, but it's a collective collective process. So it should be also, credits are very important. You know, <laughs> for me, I like, you can read a film through the credits, you know. Uh, or you, know uh, you know, when we, when I first came in contact with these images, of course, too many times I presented this archive in company of officials of the Nigerian government and Ministry of Information. So, and I've always had to check myself because I know that I'm an outsider working with an institutional archive. But when I first saw this stuff and I went into the building and there were some people there and they, who were guards, some civil servants who come to this old dusty building they, in the morning, they push some pens around and do. At the end of the day, they go home. They do this every day, patiently waiting for their retirement so they can collect their pension and go home. They have no attachment to the archive. So then I came in there and I said that, okay, look, I'm, there, was, there was strictness. You have, you are as if you are working on eggshells. And so we came out of the building and I said that, but what was the point? I've already entered the archive and I'm coming out of the archive empty handed. So, and it's always beautiful when I have to present the archive without a government official because I simply said to the director of Goethe Institute who came into the archive with me, can you step outside with them for a minute? And we went outside. I said, oh, I forgot my phone inside the archive. And I had the backpack and I went back into the archive and I took two of these scans and I put them inside the backpack and I came back outside again and they didn't say, what's in your backpack? Nobody they didn't occur to anybody that this thing is valuable. Somebody will want to see what's in them. So, Predict, but I really wanted to see what... Criminals. So I really wanted to see what's in them. Everybody's and, recording yeah, perfect. And if it was possible to steal the whole archive, I would do it. But it was not possible to steal everything. But I wanted to see this spot. But you know, something strange happened. We went back into the archive. After we got permission again, we went back inside and the at first they were strict with us. Don't do this, don't do this. But we began opening them and we, are, we put a light and they were beginning to see these images and they forgot that they were security guards. They became archivists. They were also curious to see what images we are. Oh, what, images we are. what images we are there. And they began to do our work with us, going into the room, bringing them out, trying to look what label we are in, in them. Because you see, the process of working with this stuff is also related to the process of picking a film out of it. It is, I always give the example. In Ghana, there is, there is the word Sankofa. There is an image, it's always a bird flying, but with its head turned backwards. And there's an egg on its back. So it's trying to pick the egg with its beak. There is a translation for it. It means that it is not taboo to return to the past. 
But the, the interpretation I like the most that informs my responsibility, my duty to the audience, what I do with this image is that to go into the future, you have got to return to the past. So what we are trying to do in a country in which history has been abolished from Nigerian classroom, classrooms as a standalone subject, archival practice has become a site for public memorial. It's a site so as if you construct a memorial on the road that this happened at San so period, this happened at San so period. What we want to do is take it out of the exclusivity because some few weeks back, some time ago, when I began this journey, we, I went to see the director, the owner, the director, the person owner of the archive, and there was a top Nollywood actress in the room, and he introduced me, and I said, no, I don't know the lady. And he said to her, please forgive him, he works with archive. He said it's always in the past. <laughs> so, so what we want to do is to make archive take it from something that is dusty, which only old men with beards, like my gray hair, talk about, to something which is pertinent to a young audience, if you are here and there, so that this is what memory is. Memory is not something that has passed. It is something that connects us, that enables you to go also into the future. This, I think, is my primary responsibility to my audience, whether they are in Nigeria, or they are in UK, or they are in Portugal. It is this attempt to interweave his, um, the past, the present, and the future, so we can have this proper conversation of how to negotiate what I think is, properly speaking, historical trauma that, is, uh, uh, that makes my country to want to forget everything that has gone, gone, gone before. But like Philippa said, it's also a question which we hope to broaden the coming, the coming part of this conversation. So. Yeah. yeah, I think, is there another question? I thought, okay, if we can. Acho que a pergunta é muito parecida com a que ela fez, mas é numa insistência de repensar algumas questões, especialmente no que diz respeito a espaço. Né? Um cinema decolonial tem a ver com a produção de um conhecimento decolonial, de repente. Né? Achei super interessante quando o Mário falou sobre a tarjeta, né, se para procurar o, né, é, é, é o angolano terrorista e não o, o angolano que está lutando pela sua liberdade, enfim. E aí você re, reestrutura, reestruturar conhecimento, acho que é um pouco essa a prática decolonial, né, e tem a ver com a ocupação dos espaços. Então, para vocês cineastas, ocupar um espaço como esse, nada decolonial. <risos> com acesso, nada decolonial mesmo, sendo de graça, mas não é um, 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 um espaço né, fácil, de fácil acesso para quem está na labuta é, construindo e, enfim, se mantendo. Se vocês estão conseguindo... Eu sei que você adora microfone. Ela adora microfone, é incrível. Eu gostaria de saber se vocês estão conseguindo pôr os seus filmes numa prática decolonial de assistência, né, para que outras... É, é, é repetitivo, mas é na insistência. Obrigada. Você pode traduzir? Você pode traduzir? Você pode traduzir? Bem, eu ia tentar responder, mas a pergunta era sobre se nós podemos mostrar nossos filmes in a more, uh, you said... Broader audience. Broader audience, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I think she was also uh, addressing the, the, the space, you know, the yeah. fact that what kind of space we inhabited with these discussions, and she was addressing, for example, the fact that this space is not such a colonial, col decolonial, de right. decolonized space, also with a difficult access in a, in a so I think, that was a little bit how we deal with this um, situation of uh, inhabiting these spaces and, and that are also part of a certain structure. And, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I think that that's where you, uh, once you have the archive fever, you end up in a lot of issues um, because it's not only about rescue material or it's, it's very much about contextualizing it and it's the question where, where is it shown, where is it... Um, where does it stay in the end? I mean, a digital age, you can ha have multiple copies easily um, in different locations, um, but there are a lot of other, and actually I was thinking that um, this would be a whole other panel to discuss um, the later life 
of those archives and, and put it aside. Can I just say something about it, just as an, as an answer, or is this no? Yes, you can. Maybe I, maybe I can say that, that you did uh, the, you will see this in Spellwheel, the mobile cinema. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I also, I, but also like to the question of being in places that, you know, for example, our project, yeah, it happened on the streets mainly, you know, like in Guinea Bissau, mainly, you know, like uh, then in places like that. But um, I think I, 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 I'm very interested in, in also thinking about the Milka Cabral because he had a strategy that was a strategy of how can he use um, the institution, the colonial institution as well, as a place to gather information and also gather uh, uh, empowerment, you know, like to be able to run the, the liberation process, you know. So I think we have to um, f be flexible enough to migrate to different spaces, uh, uh, colonized and decolonized, and um, in order to also contaminate, you know, and so I think it is a struggle of com coming inside and getting in, and inside and outside these spaces of power. Otherwise, how, you know, because it's like Adorno, no, like um, says, we, you know, like uh, there's no right in the wrong, you know, <laughs> we, 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 this is the system we have in power, so how to come in and also be in the places that are the places of non-power, but of potency. And this is something that we are a lot, all of us, I think, ha ha working in these spaces of non-power with a lot of effort and a very, very difficult um, uh, means. But we have also to be in these places. Otherwise, we, we yeah. you know, th this is also the work. Yeah. yeah, and also because I remember some, some few weeks ago, I was part of a panel in Berlin, and the title was Translocation of Historical Artifacts. And I said that, uh, no, the title is wrong. It's not translocation. You are trying to conduct advertising for imperialism. <laughs> we did not sit down and decide to translocate so, artifacts. They were abducted. So it is also good that this conversation is taking place against the backdrop of the argument for the restitution of historical artifacts abducted by colonial powers from colonial from former colonized countries. We are here also in spaces that are not decolonized because of the because of the situation. And also that is why also I'm thinking, I'm saying that as important as the restitution of museum pieces are, for Africans, the most important thing actually in order to fully to fully appropriate the colonial experience is that we want these images, we want the archive to be decolonized. We want you to restitute our audiovisual archives back for us so at least we can have conversation in colonial spaces, but we also want to have conversation in decolonized spaces in our own society. So this actually forms maybe a greater, much more intervention for what conversation that might arise arise tomorrow. So I appreciate the question because it's nice, it's correct. So oftentimes you find yourself presenting work asking for, you know, against the colonizers in a space that is not really, really decolonized. And who are you talking to? Who is your audience? And what are you presenting? What, what images are you presenting? But underlying this practice actually is actually is a demand for the restitution of audiovisual materials. We want these archives to be decolonized. And so. And, uh, because you just brought up the, uh, the museum, and I think what is important when we speak about films, and this is, I think, the Lisbon um, edition of this series of events is only, only the, in Lisbon it's focusing on film. When you see this, um, a, a film reel like this is an object. This is not yet a film. A film only exists in the moment of its projection. Um, so without um, um, cinema pro projection, without screenings and people watching them, the films do not exist. Um, this is nothing. Um, this is mainly uh, or only um, the, the carrier of um, um, what you see when you project it. And therefore, um, um, archive work and, and showing films go hand in hand. If you speak about the um, um, politics of archives, you have to speak about the politics of cinema and or, or um, showing um, films as well and, and exhibition of film. And uh, I think um, it's interesting that Cinematech first opened as a cinema in Cairo and then very soon found out that they have to build a counter archive as well if they want to run the cinema, if they, the cinema wants to have a future. And sometimes Whereas in Didi's case, it's the other way around. Um, 
No, it's the same. You also started with this idea of a cinema, and then you stumbled over, over the archive. But uh, and the nice thing is that because you described the cinema and how it looked like in the first place, but since then it has been renovated by the um, uh, NFC and is like now, now very. Now it looks like this. Yes, exactly. 